everybody knows already Catherine, but I am very glad to introduce Catherine Whistler, who is uh, curating this uh, fabulous exhibition on Raphael and the drawings. Uh, it's finishing in the 1st of September, so, so you, you know, we recommend that you go at the end of August, just in case you, you're going to miss this uh, amazing exhibition. It's 120 drawings, so I think this, this is once in life, and uh, I encourage you all, all of you to go. For me, it's a, a real pleasure and, and an honor that the London Art Week, uh, they, they have uh, asked me to host this event because uh, in 2009 I was uh, in, the, um, in Christie's uh, just by chance when, when the head of Mills was sold. It's one of those moments a dealer never, never forget uh, because it gives life to, to our market. And uh, at that time I didn't know that I would, would be taking over Colnaghi. So it was very nice to know that in 1815 that drone was sold by Colnaghi. So now we have Raphael, Colnaghi, Christie's, uh, <laughs> London Art Week, all together. And uh, thanks to Catherine, I think that we're going to enjoy the next, uh, the next few hours. Thank you. Okay. Several hours. Thank Several you hours. very much. And just to say before I start that all of the drawings I'm going to show you are in the exhibition. But of course, I'm not showing you 120. <laughs> um, so, well, as you know, already at the time of his death in, in 1520, um, Raphael was given the epithet divine, um, and his art was perceived above all to be characterised by grace, by nobility. Um, he was said to be beautiful and pleasing in his own person, very much the perfect courtier. Um, and ultimately his art was judged to epitomise ideal beauty, as indeed these two drawings do. This idea of Raphael as perfection took hold very, very strongly in um, the tradition. And as you know, Raphael and, and classical art went on to occupy a joint position at the absolute peak of the artistic canon for artists of the 17th century um, and beyond. The, the sort of idealised classicism that his art personified was especially influential in, in academies of art and in the teaching of academies of art all over Europe right down into the 19th century. No other European artist um, over that 400-year period since Raphael's death had such a legacy in art production and in art education. Um, it's really an extraordinary sort of sustained level of canonical status. But with modernism, Raphael was completely toppled from this um, iconic, if you like, level. Um, and I'm, I'm just starting with this, you know, just to bear in mind that the word Raphael um, does for many people epitomise things like perfection, uh, the classical tradition, a kind of teaching, a kind of art teaching with imitation at its core. And for many people today, not I think for this audience, um, the word Raphael evokes sort of sweetness and blandness, very different from the kind of um, originality that people associate with, with Leonardo or with Michelangelo. And for a lot of people out there today, you know, Raphael is seen as irrelevant. A lot of um, perceptions, these perceptions of Raphael as, you know, ideal and perfect, were based on graphic art. And this engraving by Marc Antonio Raimondi was actually quite an influential uh, piece. Raimondi shows the artist um, naturally a melancholic creative type. He's deep in thought. You can see on the left his paint pots and a palette and then the blank um, canvas awaits the realisation of his noble concepts. This engraving helped to sustain a particular appreciation of Raphael as somebody um, whose noble inventions in his mind have had a higher status than the work of his hands. In fact, the hands are concealed here beneath the heavy mantle. This is a kind of neoplatonic strand and it runs right through art history um, more broadly even. So for example in French academic theory in the, in the mid 17th century it was felt that works of art could be better appreciated um, through engravings without the distractions of paint of the sort of luscious colour and brilliant brushwork and seduction that paint brought. And in the later 18th century, um, Gottfried Lessing, in a drama of 1772, posed the question, putting it into the mouth of a painter, surely Raphael would still have been the greatest artist ever, even if he had been born without hands. So Raphael's nobility of thought 
and artistic, you know, his, his conceptual art takes precedence over execution, which can be carried out by others. This is an incredibly strong tradition. Um, in his magisterial biography of Albrecht Durer in 1948, the great art historian Erwin Panofsky concluded with an examination of the celebrated exchange of gifts between the German artist and the Italian artist, testified by this sheet, which carries an autograph inscription by Durer that reads, 1515, Raphael of Urbino, who was so highly esteemed by the Pope, made this nude image and sent it to Albrecht Durer in Nuremberg to show him his hand. Now, Erwin Panofsky um, followed the then consensus in the Raphael scholarly literature in seeing this drawing as being by Giulio Romano, Raphael's senior assistant. So Panofsky saw this sheet as demonstrating a kind of irreconcilable difference between German art theory and Italian artistic theory. Um, according to his argument, Durer, who sent Raphael as a gift a self-portrait, expected the gift in exchange to demonstrate the Italian artist's unique and God-given talent seen in the work of the you know, his actual hand. But Raphael had sent the artist something that was a specimen of his style, a drawing not carried out by his own hand, but yet epitomised his concept, um, realised in a perfected visual language. Now, even though this drawing has long since been regarded correctly as by Raphael and not by a pupil, the impact of the tradition is very strong, so that a recent art historian could write that Raphael casually selected a sheet from a workshop stash to send to Durer. Now, the Ashmolean exhibition, like Durer, is deeply concerned with the eloquence of Raphael's hand in drawing, and it explores the ways in which, rather like an orator, Raphael honed his powers of invention, his powers of expression, and his powers of persuasion through the intensity of his drawing practice. And I want to emphasise that the exhibition looks only at Raphael. It's not examining um, students, pupils, their training or the workshop. It's really tracing his, his self-realisation in drawing over the period from roughly when he emerges around 1500 as an independent artist already at the age of 17 to his very last um, months um, when he's working on the transfiguration in a drawing such as the one on the left. And do remember that Raphael, of course, was cut off at the age of 37, and who knows where he would have gone. The selection of drawings in the exhibition has as it, at its core um, 50 Ashmolean sheets and 25 from our exhibition partner, the Albertina. And this is enhanced, the selection is enhanced by generous loans from a variety of institutions, including the Royal Collection, the British Museum, the Louvre, Lille, Frankfurt, the Uffizi, and, and so on. Our exhibition is also part of a, a larger research project for which I've had a grant from the Leverhulme Trust. And the overall title of that project is Transforming Our Understanding of Raphael with Eloquence in Drawing as a Research Team. And I just want to tell you that Ben Thomas, who teaches at the University of Kent, has been my collaborator since 2014. Ben is a wonderful art historian who um, has worked extensively on Renaissance art theory, but who makes his students draw and, and makes them collect prints as well. They have a small budget, they go out and buy prints and they put on exhibitions. And I've also had the, the great um, pleasure of having Angela Maria Aceto as the research assistant on the project um, for the last just over a year. And it goes without saying that all of our findings are obviously enormously indebted to the great tradition, the substantial body of Raphael drawing scholarship, including many recent exhibition catalogues. I've just put up a selection there. Since the 19th century, um, connoisseurship and archival research have gone hand in hand. Um, scholars have been concerned with putting order on a vast amount of material, disparate and dispersed. Um, and naturally the principal concerns have been with establishing questions of authorship, um, thinking about stylistic development, thinking about chronological sequences, and of course thinking about 
function and above all the function of the drawings as preparatory works. And I think as a result that today um, the general perception of the scholarly literature is that Raphael was an artist who was utterly systematic and pragmatic in drawing, never wasting a moment, always working in a clear sequence of steps um, towards a specific commission, uh, whether surviving or just documented. And this is a kind of teleological view of Raphael's procedure. It sees his practice as entirely project oriented as utilitarian and often starts to, it, it, it tends to start very often with the painting in order to explain the drawing so for instance both of these studies in the Ashmolean I'll show you them in a minute and um, in more detail are clearly they are drapery studies for Raphael's fresco of the disputa on the stanza della segnatura and here you see the from this detail how the two drawings relate to two prominent figures this figure and this figure and art historians have explained the very different appearance of these drawings and very different choice of media by reference to the need for, in the case of the foreground figure, clarity and luminosity, and to the figure further into the middle ground for a softer effect, the figure being more distant. And of course the drawings were, were made as Raphael was at a fairly advanced point in his thinking about the design um, for the disputa. In, in semiotic terms, both the drawings relate to important shifter figures. Shifter figures have a crucial role in directing the viewer's attention, grabbing your attention and then making you follow through across this, this multi-figured scene. But if we think again about the material qualities and the visual effects in each case, in each of these drawings, I think we become aware of perhaps some tensions between the conceptual and the gestural. If we look at the drawing on the left, um, our examination of this drawing um, has shown that Raphael began he didn't begin over a, a black chalk um, sketch, as is, as is usually stated. He actually began with brush and washes. Um, he, he began by making this very elegant silhouette in wash. Then he created a tonal study with these lovely V-shaped loops, um, considering how folds of drapery catch the light as the figure moves forward. His choice of technique impelled his thinking on this beautiful figure in that he, he created a harmonious and tapering form. But as we discovered, he then took up black chalk, and black chalk is a kind of earthy material, and he really roughened up the texture of this brush drawing. He deepened the tonalities, as of course, but he also gave a kind of material weight to the drawing by working over it and then added some white. In the case of this study, his approach is completely different. Here he is um, using probably this earthy black chalk, though it could be charcoal, we're not 100% sure. Rather than enclosing the form within a kind of harmonious shape, the form actually emerges as Raphael's hand moves on the sheet of paper in very um, loose and circular or curving strokes. It's a, it's a very grainy material that he's holding in his hand. And then these strokes become more powerful and swirling as he builds up the form. The freedom of handling is utterly remarkable in this sheet. And Raphael essentially is layering the material very densely. He's smudging it with his fingers. He's rubbing in some white chalk. And at the, at the end, he just adds this exuberant sort of flourish like that, as though to say, that's, that's done. And I think the drawing has, it's a very tactile, very sensuous um, drawing as a result of this more gestural um, approach. I think you can see that the, the rhetorical possibilities that drapery has are clear here. Raphael was exploring drapery um, for the ways that it can articulate physical movement, for the ways uh, that it can describe the role of a figure in a narrative, or give a specific historical character to a figure, but also through his choice of materials and his mode of handling as he's drawing, Raphael discovers, and if you like, embodies um, through drapery, on the left, his vision of this live, um, eager, youthful figure, and on the right, a sense of a more mature kind of, if you like, a more complex maturity. Now, the other side of this sheet is almost always discussed in relation, first of all, to the sketchy black chalk figure, pointing figure here, who is clearly related to what Raphael went on to study, and is preliminary to the drapery study. And then there is the presumption that this nude female figure must be a preparatory study for a muse in the fresco of the Parnassus. 
the fascination of this sheet, I think, lies with the contrast between verbal and visual rhetoric. Um, as you can see, having, having sketched out this figure in black chalk, then studied it more densely, Raphael turned back to the sheet, pen in hand, to compose a sonnet on the theme of love. And in this draft, we see him exploring very familiar um, conventions from Petrarch, in fact. Raphael seeking new and graceful effects. You see him obliterating lines and scoring out words and testing rhymes and as, uh, as he's composing and then writing it, beginning to write a neat, new, um, elegant draft of it at the top. But um, perhaps, you know, because of the difficulties in composition, <coughs> he picked up a stylus to make some very loose sketches in all of the blank areas on the sheet. Um, this stylus leaves an indented mark. It doesn't leave a visible trace, just an indentation on the page. And it's as though perhaps it's a displacement activity. He's improvising, he's releasing new thoughts, he's, he's stopping composing the poem. And then he takes up the pen and from his style of sketching pulls out this idea of a nude woman, a nude reclining woman and a companion who's very schematically indicated. And she seems to be resting on, on a sort of billowing form. It could be clouds, it could be a bed, it could be grass, not very, not, very, not clear at this stage. And what's happening here is that Raphael's utter ease in inventiveness is set against the difficulty of the verse composition um, in this very playful juxtaposition that he creates on the sheet of a relaxed and seductive female with this rather oratorical male figure. And notice how the way in which um, um, her arm overlaps with his arm, her leg overlaps with his leg, and something strange is going on here that I would welcome your thoughts on. Um, um, so, you know, it's as though Raphael's thinking on Petrarchan themes of love generated the female nude. Her seductive form chimes with the themes of the lyric poetry. Love, of course, is a topic for writers who need the inspiration of the muses. Hence, Raphael could then explore this figural invention further in thinking about the muses and Parnassus. So the way we're thinking about drawings in, in in the Oxford exhibition is to move away from always the project mm -hmm. and to treat each drawing as a singular work, as a blank sheet of paper upon which Raphael drew, often in quite layered ways um, and per perhaps quite a while before painting in some cases. He's generating ideas and he's working adventurously. So we're also exploring the, the cognitive and the expressive um, dimensions of drawing as well. So in this extraordinarily beautiful sheet from Vienna. It's really a brainstorming sheet. We see Raphael uh, making reiterations and variations on the theme of the mother and child, who is also, of course, the all-powerful virgin and Christ child. And he starts with the red chalk, more or less in the centre of the sheet, in a very loose um, sketch um, of the child pressed up against the, 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 the forehead and nose of the mother. Um, red chalk, perhaps, because it is so warm and so, so soft. But then he rapidly moves up to the right and up to the left, generating these new shapes using circular and elliptical motions in, in, and, and schematic, rather geometric forms. So it is a kind of conceptual approach, but it's infused with emotion, with tenderness, also because he's calling on his memories of pictorial or sculptural images, and he's drawing on his own observations of the behaviour of mothers with their babies. Then he stops and he takes up the pen, which signals a kind of sharpening of, if you like, cognitive and manual um, processes. He very swiftly develops, he reverses, he echoes, he revises the ideas he's captured in the red chalk, while still retaining this kind of intensive graphic energy. As you can see, um, going down on the left and then up to the right and down to the lower right, the child starts separating himself from his mother's breast or from his mother's arms, and here lower right starts exploring the external world. Very, very vivacious pen lines, very lavish use of ink. Um, the virgin's arms, where, are, you know, where is her arm? It's moving in front of our eyes as, as she's restraining her child. So there, these are Raphael's um, reflections on the implications of this separation of the child from the mother, because there are theological implications here, as well as emotional ones. Now, 
we can map, if you like, these variations on the Virgin and Child onto several devotional paintings that Raphael produced in Florence around 1506 to 1508. But none of these sketches can be considered to be for a painting. Instead, through the act of drawing, Raphael is discovering um, inventions. He's pursuing their psychological and their formal uh, potential. And he's effectively entering into a kind of conversation with this familiar, very familiar, but yet theologically complex um, subject. So drawing here is about improvisation and it's about reflection. It's a gathering of ideas on paper, while again, the way the hand moves can also trigger new thoughts. Drawing, of course, um, can also be highly intentional, um, involving direct observation, whether of um, people or of sculpture or paintings and it involves recollections from memory. And this is an earlier sheet um, where 1502 to 3 where Raphael is using metal point um, on a prepared paper here given a lovely uh, bluey grey tone and he envisages a group of four figures. He's testing the poses from a couple of models who are wearing everyday studio dress, so your sort of garzone uh, figures, and we can imagine them moving and turning in response to his instructions. Um, it's a very, he, he places them in a kind of atmospheric setting because of this lovely uh, silvery blue. And as he draws, you can see him again changing his mind, changing positions of arms and legs, so lots of improvisation, a certain amount of jotting, this lovely calligraphic sort of curves and loops um, in the background um, as though he's animating the sheet. But at the same time, he's calling from his well-stocked visual memory particular poses and attitudes that he had admired in the paintings of Luca Signorelli. So two of these poses on the right and on the left are quotes from Luca Signorelli. Um, the drawing form part of his thinking on um, um, designs that he'd been asked to supply already at this early age, this is a 19 year old artist, he'd been asked to supply them for a senior artist, Pintoricchio, for a prestigious commission at the Piccolomini Library in Siena. So Raphael's already well known for his capacity in drawing, in disegno. So in thinking about this whole um, project, the research project and the exhibition about eloquence of drawing, um, we've been bearing in mind as a double time frame, the way in which Raphael's drawings can speak to today's viewers as intimate sketches that give us an insight into, into how his hand moves and into his creative thinking, um, and also their nature as physical objects that have, of course, survived the centuries sometimes with alterations, but as objects that were made at a specific historical and cultural moment. And we, we wanted the exhibition very much to, um, on the one hand, to show Raphael's search for a persuasive graphic language through his short career, um, and also to present quite a comprehensive view of his interests and his, indeed his versatility in, in drawing. And because of the specific cultural moment he's living in, he, Raphael, as well as every Renaissance artist and writer, would have been utterly familiar with the categories of invention, composition, and expression that are, that are at the root of, of rhetoric and of eloquence. And in thinking about the exhibition, I'm just going to show you um, this was just an early uh, plan, you know, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, don't worry. But just to show you, we have three exhibition galleries and you come in over a sort of bridge. And our idea was that, the and this is how it evolved, that, um, you know, in a sense, the first gallery is about inventiveness, the second gallery is about composition, and the third gallery is about expression. But we're not rigid in any way. In fact, it follows a nice chronological flow. The first gallery takes Raphael from his native Urbino through his time in Le Marche and in um, Umbria and Tuscany up to the end of his stay in Florence. So in the first gallery we see Raphael, if you like, inventing himself as an artist through drawing, sketching, observing, reflecting, appropriating, um, always visually alert. Um, we in the second room, in the centre, we go with we go with Raphael to Rome, and we find him there, obviously, immediately dealing with the stanza della segnatura and with frescoes um, in the Vatican apartments. And there, we're thinking about how he had to create huge frescoes on quite abstract themes and how he had to compose and, if you like, orchestrate. So we're thinking about. Um, 
elements such as his use of the expressive body, his use of drapery, um, different kinds of figure studies, his search for design solutions. And of course, his drawings are in, informed by a new understanding of classical art that he that he researches so intensively in Rome. And in the third room, we're still in Rome, um, Raphael working on a range of projects outside of the Vatican Stanze, so including tapestry designs, including lots of work for Agostino Chigi, the wealthy um, banker. And we see very much um, the affective qualities of his drawings. We thought of that room as being a, about expression, as being about the enchantment of drawing, and also Raphael's, the ways in which he's thinking more and more about how to move the viewer, how to affect the viewer, ways of persuading the viewer. So that's just to give you a quick overview um, of how, how we thought about the exhibition. But looking at Cross Raphael's career, it's clear that already um, from his early career, he um, developed a method in drawing of really working through contrasts, or if you like, antitheses, both of imagery and of graphic technique. And in Florence, his ambition was very much fed um, by Leonardo in, in the case of this um, wonderful um, sheet from the Ashmolean where he actually sets himself a real challenge because here Raphael is drawing in metal point which as you know uh, I mean, we've, seen, we've seen a drawing already on a bluish grey ground um, but here he doesn't give himself that mid-tone he uses a white prepared ground so all of the all of the tonalities have to be done through the metal point um, which is quite a testing um, technique dependent entirely on meticulous shading and remember it's indelible as well and in the principal study here on the right you can see how with an absolutely I mean an extraordinarily subtle mesh of delicate lines Raphael shaped not only this powerful sculptural head that catches the light but he also imbued it with an extraordinary sense of character indeed it's a rather enigmatic character a little bit Leonardesque in, in that sense. He did add a few touches of bright white heightening, which have now oxidised. So the slightly greyish marks on the forehead and upper cheek and chin would have been bright white. Um, he then, and he drew he drew the um, active gripping hand and the more relaxed hand as well. He turned the sheet around, um, and again providing a real contrast of youth and age and of types of drawing in terms of the level of finish. He modelled this um, <coughs> the features of this rather fierce elderly man, almost but not quite verging on caricature. So again, very much um, thinking of Le the Leonard desk. And then he turned the sheet around again, and uh, you can see in the detail on the left um, that he's emulating Leonardo's mode of rapid improvisation and sketching and drawing. Um, and in fact, he's basing these sketches on actual Leonardo drawings that he's able to study in Florence. Um, what he's doing is um, using the metal point to make copies of drawings that are in chalk or in pen. Wanting to, he wants to understand and to internalise Leonardo's mode of drawing, Leonardo's hand in drawing. Um, as you might have noticed, the youthful head, or perhaps you haven't, has, has an indication of a halo. And Raphael did um, make use of this figure, I mean, in a fresco in, in um, San Severo in Perugia, um, as indeed the hands also relate to this figure. So in a sense, this is a preparatory drawing. Nonetheless, as a sheet of studies, it clearly it's a series of responses to the challenges posed by Leonardo's virtuosity in drawing and by Leonardo's ideas on physiognomy um, um, and, and, and human types. Many sheets in our first gallery, where that sheet also is, um, show um, Raphael's voracious appetite for new stimuli. Um, including um, particularly his study of the heroic nude, the muscular male nude, often in dramatic or aggressive groupings. And Michelangelo, of course, was a particular inspiration. And there on the left, I show you Raphael's adaptation and interpretation of the David. On the right, um, Raphael is really fusing antique and Michelangelesque 
um, sources in thinking about the aggressive male nude. He builds this composition essentially around three groups. It's quite a wild kind of drawing. Each group has got a standing active man and a more passive um, figure. So you've got one group with a man on the left and a figure prone on the ground. Another group in the centre with a, a man um, pulling at a kneeling captive figure. And then the back view here with a man holding a falling or perhaps dead um, body. So again, each group is completely contrasting and varied in relation to the other. The torsion of the kneeling figure in the centre acts as a kind of pivot um, for the whole design. It kind of gives a circular motion to the whole design. And then Raphael adds a couple of extra figures behind, um, including this screaming figure with wonderful uh, corkscrew curls, wonderful sort of gestural flourishes there. So again, pursuing variety and um, if you like, narrative energy. And this is something he takes very much to Rome and develops hugely in Rome as he has to orchestrate these extraordinary frescoes in the Stanza della Segnatura, particularly with their abstract themes such as philosophy. How do you make a large group of philosophers look not only interesting but compelling enough for you to want to look again and again? Um, so again, we see his delight and his way of working in contrasts as a way of sort of fueling his, his thinking in designing. Um, so for example, um, he, he also likes to think of a particular figure and then compose where, uh, others around it. So on the left side of that sheet, you can see there's a group um, around um, a seated man who's writing, a philosopher who's writing, and this will become the Pythagoras group in the School of Athens fresco. Um, Raphael worked outwards from that seated figure. Um, the philosopher is intensely engaged in writing and he gives the pose a kind of dynamism through the sort of thrusting movement of the foot and leg, which is sort of pushing him upwards. And then he starts adding contrasting and varied figures around him. None of them is a completely drawn figure. The, you know, the philosopher is the completely drawn figure. The others are variations and contrasts. You've got a, an elderly man at the left who's sort of pushing forward to see what's being written. You've got a, a lovely young, enthusiastic, sort of springing, long-haired boy at the right. And you've got a, a mature man who's sort of leaning forward and inwards. So it's developing, and he, he indicates other figures, it's developing into this very lively group. He then stops and then he draws in the centre of the sheet from the life um, a standing counterpoised man, another kind of protagonist, um, who really contrasts with the kind of urgent concentration that you get in the Pythagoras group. And there the model, he's drawing from the model, the model's leaning on a kind of stick to hold this very complicated turning pose. And then Raphael moves from observation to, if you like, imagination and fantasy to construct expressive folds of drapery around this figure. Um, he does tend to think of uh, forms uh, in terms of modules or units that can be joined together. Um, if you look at this sheet, which has several fighting men, Raphael's drawing over some st he sketches lightly with the stylus and then he builds it up in each figure up in red chalk. He started with the central, very prominent figure he's drawn first. Um, and um, he's, Raphael would have tested the pose from the life, but what he's actually done is he's, he's, if you, he's drawn, the, he's conceived of the torso and whirling arms as one unit and the legs as another. They don't quite join together. They don't quite work. But there's great panache there. So he's joining two different um, uh, elements together um, and he then added this desperately twisting figure beneath the figure's legs um, again slightly reversing the standing figure's um, attitude um, next he comes up with the expressive back view here turning away and then as a contrast he adds on the left the, the, the figure who's plunging outwards and downwards and then finally just up there in the centre, in a very schematic, sketchy way, he draws this screaming head um, and an arm, just indicating a figure to answer um, that one. This sheet actually becomes a kind of visual resource for Raphael. He, he, <coughs> he remembers it. Later, here he is in this um, ink study. Um, if you look at that figure again with his arms whirling upwards, he's just emerging here as a whirling figure, there's his head, there's his arms, out of this melee of um, frenzied um, drawing. Um, 
Now, Raphael's inventiveness of drawing, of course, is very much at the forefront of the exhibition. And it's fascinating to have a sheet like this, of which there must have been very, very many, where he's in a complete creative moment of improvising and working so fast that his hand can barely sort of keep pace with his thoughts. Um, and there is a problem of survival here because the reason this drawing has come down to us is because of the beautifully, beautifully studied, meticulous, analytical life, you know, series of life studies on the other side, which could have acted as an exemplary work in the studio or as a drawing that a collector would have wanted to own, whereas this kind of drawing doesn't survive. So we're very lucky in having um, these two. Now, R Raphael brought the red chalk study of the fighting men. He used this for a detail in the School of Athens, which is there um, beneath the statue of Apollo over there on the left. It's a fictive sculpture. Is this drawing essentially preparatory for that detail? Um, I mean, possibly yes, but I, I guess what we're arguing is that this drawing um, is part of an intensive campaign of drawing before Raphael starts painting when he's moving from sheet to sheet, generating new ideas, um, very much st stimulated by both his uh, deepening study of Michelangelo and of the antique. Um, and it's, it certainly sums up um, where he had come to in Florence before moving to Rome. And he had been preoccupied there, as I've mentioned, with themes of the heroic nude and also the virgin and child, or the, rather the protective mother and the tender child. And he brings these themes together in Rome, um, in, um, first of all, in some of his explorations for the Stanza della Segnatura, notably the Judgment of Solomon um, on the ceiling of the Stanza della Segnatura. But he, he then decided um, to produce, in order to, um, if you like, present his extraordinary powers of composition and orchestration, um, he made the decision to produce a, an engraving, um, an innovative work that involving a collaboration with the expert printmaker Marc Antonio Raimondi, which would reach a hugely, I mean, an international audience. For that scene, uh, we brought together a number of, um, of the drawings in which Raphael is really um, staging aggressive nudes and protective, fearful female figures. It's a horrifically violent composition that becomes something more choreographed, more balletic in the final engraving. <coughs> in the drawings, we see him exploring um, emotional contrast, exploring emotions such as fear, um, and also um, working again with these antitheses of, you know, the the frightened women, the tender children, and the muscular, powerful um, male aggressors, or drapery, because the women <coughs> will be draped, the men, the men nude. So different kinds of antitheses, antitheses underlie this um, design. Raphael's um, interest in drapery, and again, I've mentioned this at the start, it's the rhetorical possibilities, really come out more and more in studies um, for, the, um, for the stanze, um, and particularly as we move towards the Parnassus. And I'm showing you um, two beautiful sheets in pen and ink um, over some stylus indications um, in the case of, of, of the drawing on the, on the right. Um, and what we find is, as in the sheet on the left, um, the, these very, especially in the central part of the drapery, there are incredibly convoluted patterns of fabric that take on a kind of autonomous character, the sort of labyrinthine folds. And Raphael is really drawing in an incredibly assured way with a kind of graceful fluency. And I've tried to copy these folds, and I can tell you it's really, really difficult to follow the lines as Raphael was drawing. And the folds there on the left don't really bear any relation to the body beneath. They have this wonderful life of their own. On the right um, here, um, as Raphael's hand moves down the sheet, we find very controlled, very refined uh, lines that follow his initial concept. She is the tragic muse. She's holding the, the mask of tragedy. She's Melpomene. His initial concept um, of the tragic muse as a, a kind of crisply sculptural figure. But as you move down the drawing, there's a kind of impetus that seems to gather, and the lines very much change in character. They take on a kind of forcefulness that seems to equal in intensity the dramatic um, um, the, sorry, the poetic fury of the dramatist, the tragic 
the tragedian, um, when, it, when the tragedian is gripped by the inspiration of the muse. This is an actually really astonishing burst of graphic energy here. It's exuberant, and it seems to capture Raphael's developing thoughts on the, the beautiful daughter of, of the god, Zeus, who can induce a creative frenzy in writers, and there's the frenzy. I think in each case, um, whether the convoluted folds or, this, or the kind of inky depths of the windblown drapery, Raphael is very much taking license from the antique um, in terms of spirited excess and releasing um, a kind of linear eloquence that affords us um, delight. Drapery is really, you know, it's partly a mode for creative exploration. Um, it's a way, perhaps, Raphael himself to find stimulation and pleasure. And a later writer called Anton Francesco Doni, um, in talking about drawing, um, talks about l'intelligenza dei panni, the, the intelligence of drapery. And, and it's it's a sort of place where artists can explore and be freely um, creative. Here, Raphael's thinking of the figure of the Madonna. He studies the child separately, um, who will become the Madonna of François Premier, a prestigious um, painting. Um, and he's using um, red chalk. Again, this is a mineral. This is a sort of earthy, um, warm material with very much um, exploring its tactile qualities. And we, here again, we have a mode of excess, a kind of stylish um, creativity. Raphael is taking, if you look at that drapery, he's taking drapery to <coughs> extremes of plausibility. These, these folds are impossible, you know, in their weight, in their monumentality. Um, he tracks them first to some extent with the stylus, and then he just models with great, great richness um, with the red chalk, creating these kind of furrows and hollows that make us think of natural forms, of cascades, or even of geological um, formations. Um, the the modelling is very visible. You can see the kind of repetitive strokes, the iterations of the artist's hand, making the drapery and body a kind of, I think, a kind of spiritual ideal in its materiality. It resonates with thought and with feeling on the supremely powerful nature of the Madonna. This is the Madonna as mother of God, as queen of heaven and earth, as the, 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 the protector and intercessor whose mantle whose drapery can embrace all of the faithful. So Raphael's very intensive study of in drawing of drapery, of facial expressions, of hands, um, really indicates throughout his career his preoccupation with these elements, which are so vital in communication and indeed in oratory. And I think, I hope you'll agree, it's clear he often investigates and presents them um, through drawing in ways that are more subtle or more adventurous than painting can be or that they are in the final paintings and I think through the exhibition it's possible to follow Raphael's deepening understanding um, of psychological and emotional states what Leonardo called the motions of the mind um, an understanding that again he developed through the process of drawing and this takes further stimulus for him from his intensive study of the antique during his Rome years this capacity um, reaches extraordinary levels, as you'll agree, I'm sure, um, of profundity in elaborate studies, particularly this one, for the Transfiguration. Um, this is developed on the basis of a fully re realised um, final cartoon. We're at the point where there is a full-scale linear design um, for the painting, which has been transferred onto this blank sheet of paper through pouncing. So you've got where the, the, the lines of the final design have been finely pricked and charcoal dust um, dabbed through. So you can see dotted lines from that transfer process. So Raphael began on this sheet with a kind of visible underdrawing of dotted lines. But because we can see so many of the dots, we can see how he moved away from um, the, the final design as well. But essentially in this sheet, um, so these studies, sorry, are normally known in the literature as auxiliary cartoons. Um, the idea is that they have the function of providing detailed indications for the expressive heads to be painted in the final altarpiece. And certainly they are extraordinarily elaborate and must have taken Raphael hours to draw. We can see him in this drawing working in a very concentrated, very reflective manner with an absolutely virtuoso handling of the black chalk. 
we can see him drawing with quite vigorous marks, as in part of the hair, or creating effects through the most delicate and subtle and sensitive modelling, you know, barely visible modelling. Here, drawing really is a mode of engaging with the complex emotional states of these protagonists. These are apostles. They are privileged followers of Christ who are yet failing to cure a possessed boy and relieve his terrorised family. So each protagonist, and here again notice the juxtapositions of youth and age of different types, of the open hands, the closed hands, each protagonist has to have individualised reactions and feelings. And these have to come through, the feelings of, of sympathy, of pity, of anxiety, of pe I mean, I'm not doing justice to the complex emotions that lie behind um, that drawing. And in Raphael's time, elite society, educated society, is absolutely steeped in classical culture. For, for Cicero, <coughs> Quintilian, um, the orator, and the education of the orator is very much the education of the gentleman. The orator's intense preparation for a convincing performance, and this is whether you're a theologian or a lawyer or a statesman or a leader, um, it, to prepare, to convince your audience, the orator has to imagine and experience in his own mind the emotions that he needs to convey in order to sway his audience. And for Raphael, I think this is what drawing, this kind of intense drawing, affords. This is drawing as an act of empathy. And I think in terms of the levels of psychological portrayal that he achieves, um, these are sublime effects that actually go far beyond what is there in the painting. So I just want to conclude by saying I think it is also possible to argue from the evidence of the drawings that Raphael was also highly aware of their visual impact and of potential um, viewers, whether these are friends or visitors um, or beyond that. And we've benefited to some extent um, by our um, paper conservators in the Ashmole, and we only have one and a half paper conservators, um, who have been able to do some investigation using raking light and other techniques um, of some drawings, which, which reveal the extent to which um, he used the stylus, for example. I've mentioned earlier the stylus leaving um, indentations on the sheet, so Raphael sketching with the stylus in ways where he could read his sketch, although we can't particularly see it um, today. And our scrutiny of the sheets has really highlighted their very, very layered qualities, whereas something that appears to be you know, a graceful pen drawing, actually there's a lot of sketching going on um, beneath that. Here, um, we're back in Florence, um, Raphael around 1507 was tackling various um, Hercules themes in drawings, um, very popular subject in Florence, and he does make other drawings we don't have in the exhibition that are quite emphatic, rather heavy, slightly hard studies of, of Hercules and his labours. In this sheet, um, again, it's a, it's a reiteration of something he's explored elsewhere. He's aiming very much for lightness of effect. And there is some, for Hercules himself, there's some quite controlled drawing with the blind stylus that sort of places um, the forms. There's some really free sketching around the line, the Nemean line. And he then um, takes up the ink to sort of pull out their forms, but very deliberately varying um, the finish here. And I think this might have been an autonomous drawing, something made to be admired, to be viewed, to be appreciated. Um, the pen work is very fluid, it's even sort of calligraphic, it's expressive in evoking the, um, the danger and the fierceness of the line, but the line is left very, very sketchily uh, drawn. The viewer's imagination has to complete this, this monstrous beast. Hercules is more richly modelled, um, his body invokes you know, the classical world, um, as well as relief sculpture, large or small scale. Um, there's a wonderful arc, this, this wonderful sort of billow or wave-like form. It seems to break into foam, his drapery. Um, again, it's giving us a kind of sense of the thrill of, of victory as well as the physical effort involved. And he dipped the pen in ink um, to create these kind of darker points across the drawing that lead our eye um, um, through it and create re graphic relationships on the sheet. And these drawings are made at a time, it's, you know, we're just in this we're just beginning to be in this age, in the 1500s, when conversations about disegno 
um, by the nature of drawing, the nature of design, were expected of gentlemen and of courtiers, and where the pleasure and the interest that disegno and drawings could bring um, were becoming part of elite sort of social currency. And I'm finishing by just going back to the sheet Raphael sent to Durer, um, just to look at it more closely for a couple of minutes. He was, of course, thinking around this time, um, it would be 15, 14 to 15, of the heroic male figure as um, a protagonist in historical narratives, in frescoes, in tapestries. Um, and he may have had multiple purposes in mind in drawing these, these nudes, including providing exemplary models for his pupils, perhaps. Um, and the drawing was copied. Um, as, as you probably know, the main figure does appear quite prominently in a fresco in the Stanza dell'Incendio in the Vatican, the Battle of Ostia. So very typically what Raphael does here on the blank sheet is, with the stylus, he starts with the central, the, 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 the pointing, this very oratorical again, commanding, declamatory figure. Um, he, just, he just marks as the boundaries of this figure with the blind stylus, so just fixing where the figure is going to be placed. He's looking for a crisp silhouette, so he sharpens the red chalk and models the figure with the utmost um, care and finesse. Very, very beautiful. Um, the figure is very commanding. He's sort of turning in space, carving out space, animating the space around him. Um, then Raphael draws the second figure, which is a complete antithesis in terms of you know, um, introvert versus extrovert and so on. And he draws that figure very, again, places it very carefully so there's no um, disruption. So the, the beautiful elbow of the, of the arm on the hip touches but is not disrupted by the elbow of the other figure. And you have this lovely counterpoint of sort of bending arms and crossed legs and moving, sort of swinging hips that create a kind of rhythmic relationship between these forms. Having drawn those two figures, Raphael then picked up something else, which is a lead point. So it's a stylus with lead that does leave a mark, a greyish mark. You can see it. And he draws a really schematic in between, but faintly, very faintly, there's a really schematic indication of legs, a very sort of um, raw schematic indication. And then at the top, he gives... Um, so he's, he's suggesting there's going to be a third figure, and then he gives him a character. He draws... Um, just the features um, of the face um, there. So he doesn't want to disturb the relationships, the visual relationships or the figural relationships between those two, um, or indeed the subtlety of the space between them. So he lets that fragmentary head speak for the whole. Now Durer was very meticulous in recording information. He collected drawings and he often inscribed them. And it's, it's a very sensitively placed inscription as well. Durer identified this as a gift from Raphael and a demonstration of his skilled hand. And certainly we can see that the expressive eloquence of the male nude and the virtuoso use of red chalk are on view to us. The lead point, that sketch in the middle, that very schematic, rough, indication in faint grey reveals instead the raw processes underlying representation. It defines the distance between formulaic, indicative, conceptual marks and the absolute convincing illusionism of real figures with real character that we see in the final red chalk drawing. Raphael selected this sheet to, to, send, this sheet to send to Dürer or made it for him. That is a question, and I'm beginning to think that he made it for him. Um, but that is that is something uh, I think to be debated. Um, so, ideas about eloquence and drawing, in specifically historical terms, I think can bring new perceptions of Raphael's practice and the significance the drawing held from him. Um, the visual evidence of the drawings, as, as I hope you've seen, demonstrates his concerns with invention, with orchestration, with expression, and with the rhetorical possibilities of drawing more broadly, their eloquence. And of course, all of these concerns relate to what Raphael needed to communicate in his final paintings, frescoes, tapestries, altarpieces, and so on. So without denying that relationship, what we're trying to do in this exhibition is to urge our audience to discover a new vision of Raphael purely through drawing and to view these sheets, <coughs> sheets that might be vividly animated and gestural like the black chalk drawing on the left 
or very, very elaborate, highly worked, almost a presentation drawing here on the right, to view these sheets as compelling works that convey his extraordinary creative and expressive powers. Thank you very much. It is an amazing exhibition, a once in a gen generation show, which I saw last week, and uh, I'll be seeing again before it finishes on the 3rd of September. In another wonderful link uh, to the show in Oxford, one of the London Art Week participants, Stephen Ongpin, is a sponsor of the exhibition. The last Raphael drawing show in the UK was in 1983, and I was too young to notice it on the radar, or was just not engaged with the subject. London Art Week is proud to organise this talk, and would also like to thank the Kalmagi team, and in particular Jorge, Merce and Alice for their help. Please do share London Art Week, hashtag Raphael Drawings, <laughs> and do enjoy a drink and some nibbles on us. Thank you very Thank much. You.